One, two, three, four. Sergeant Moore, you still there? Sergeant Moore, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, could you give me a five count, please? From the podium, I'll give you one. Okay. Yes, I appreciate it. Sergeant Moore, you still there? Yeah, how much longer? Okay, we're ready. She did, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, good morning to all of you. And uh, General Dempsey, this is Brian Whitman at the Pentagon. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Well, thank you, General, uh, for being with us today. Uh, and welcome to the press corps here. Uh, I think all of you know our briefer today is Lieutenant General Martin Dempsey. He is the commander of the Multinational Security Transition Command in Iraq. And uh, as such, he and his organization are responsible for assisting the Iraqi government in the development, uh, organization, training, equipping, uh, sustaining the Iraqi security forces. As you all know, um, or if you don't, uh, General Dempsey assumed command on 8 September of uh, this past year. But he previously commanded the 1st Armored Division in Baghdad for uh, 14 months during uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. And uh, he is prepared to tell you a little bit about what he's up to and what the command is doing and then going to take some questions. So thank you again, General Dempsey, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Well, as mentioned, I command the Multinational Security Transition Command here in Iraq, which is more commonly known as Min Sticky. Permit me to make a brief opening statement, and then I'll be glad to take your questions. Minstiki is responsible for the development of the Iraqi security forces. There's both a quantitative and a qualitative component to this task. 
and we address both. There's also both a local tactical level and a national institutional element to this task, and we address both of those as well. Stated another way, we're responsible for the development of Iraqi security forces, military and police, from soldier to minister of defense, and from policeman to minister of interior. We assist Iraq, build units, develop leaders, and establish systems. We approach this task along three primary lines of operation. First, the initial training of individuals, the formation and initial training of battalions, the fielding of their equipment, and the construction of the facilities in which they live, train, and maintain. In this effort, we are closely linked with Lieutenant General J.R. Vines and his multinational corps here in Iraq, who provide the embedded trainers and transition teams who then establish partner relationships with Iraqi units as they become operational and enter the fight. Second, the development of institutional systems such as pay, promotion, logistics, medical, communications, budgeting, contracting, and other national institutional systems necessary to support forces in the field. And third, the professionalization of these military and police forces so that they become institutions that will endure and that, the, and that will contribute to national cohesion through emphasis on human rights, diversity, and the rule of law. Those are the major muscle movements, and so the question is, how are we doing? Well, while we are here discussing them, 100 battalions of Iraqi army soldiers are conducting security operations throughout the country. Another 27 battalions of special police are distributed around the country, providing a bridge between combat operations and civil police operations. The Iraqi Navy is guarding its coastline and protecting the offshore oil platforms. The Iraqi Air Force is moving supplies throughout the country, including some of the materials necessary for the upcoming elections. Iraqi border police are manning 170 border forts and 22 ports of entry. 75,000 Iraqi policemen are patrolling Iraq cities, and another 7,300 Iraqi policemen are in training. 2,700 Iraqi soldiers are in training, 500 Army officer cadets, and 286 police officer cadets are in training. It's important to note that the majority of, these instruct of the instructors conducting this training are Iraqi instructors. Today, when an Iraqi soldier or a policeman joins the service, he or she pledges an oath to Iraq and to its constitution. In the elections of January 2005, approximately 130,000 Iraqi security forces secured the polling sites. When the elections of December 2005 occur in just a few weeks, 225,000 Iraqi security forces will secure the polling sites. When I was here a little more than a year ago, we were looking to put an Iraqi face on security problems. Today, neither we nor our Iraqi counterparts talk about putting an Iraqi face on security problems. We talk about finding an Iraqi solution. Of course, while we are here discussing these Iraqi security forces, and while those hundreds of thousands of Iraqi soldiers and policemen are out on patrol, and while the future leaders of a free Iraq are being groomed in the classroom, there are obviously other forces working hard to pull Iraq apart. We're working harder. At the beginning of this statement, I said that we must address both the quantity and the quality of the Iraqi security forces. That's because in the clash of arms, physical courage and superior training carry the day. But in the clash of ideas, moral courage and perseverance determine the outcome. This war requires extraordinary amounts of each of these. We understand that, and so increasingly do our Iraqi counterparts. At this point, I'd be happy to take your questions. Well, thank you for that overview, General Dempsey, and uh, we'll get right into it here. Uh, Mr. Aldinger. Uh, General Charlie Allinger with Reuters. Um, how much are you spending in the current year, uh, how much is the United States spending in the current year on uh, training Iraqi security forces, training and equipping, and maybe if you could break that down. And there are reports that you uh, would like to increase that or plan to increase that by as much as $3.9 in the coming year. Could you comment on that or any, any increase you might be considering? Uh, well, let me answer the question this way. We have the Iraqi Security Forces Fund, 
which runs through 30 September of uh, calendar year 06, uh, budgeted in the course of a two-year spend plan about just over $10 billion. And we're, we have a spend plan to uh, uh, purchase the training and equipping infrastructure development uh, that we need in 06 to build that out. We have just begun the process of identifying how far along in our plan that will take us. It, it was never the case that this force that we uh, felt we need to build for them uh, to account for their own internal security would be completed uh, with that $10.6 billion. And so the issue became uh, at what point they began to contribute to their own security. And so we've been working very closely with them in their budget. It's one of the institutional development systems that I mentioned earlier. They are, uh, they are coming to grips with the fact that they're, they're now part of a, uh, they're out of a command-directed economy and very much into a free market economy where defense competes with other things uh, in terms of governmental priorities. So we don't have back yet exactly what they will have in their security budget. We think we know, but that budget hasn't been approved yet by the Transitional National Assembly. When it is, then we'll compare what they have and what we have remaining in the Iraqi Security Forces funds, and we'll have a better idea of what a potential potential supplemental would be. And then, based on all that, we'll come up with a, a, a prioritization list. Most important, walking our Iraqi counterparts through this process with us so that they begin to take ownership in a, in a financial way for their security and, and for, the, uh, um, for, for uh, re restoring their own security forces uh, in the country. Uh, General, just a brief follow-up. I believe you said you have the United States has ten billion dollars budgeted over a two-year period for, for training and equipping the Iraqis. Um, is that in, in the in the in the current calendar year and the upcoming calendar year, the ten billion dollars, and how much of that have you spent so far? How much remains? The supplementals came to us. Is that the the supplemental comes in? A, it's the fiscal year 05 supplemental, but. It's uh, the spend plan runs out through 30 September of 06. To answer your question, I've got about $3.5 billion that is programmed but not yet uh, committed uh, to carry me through uh, into the beginning of 06. Go ahead. General, this is Bob Burns from AP. I wonder if you would look ahead uh, <clears throat> into the future and what is the plan for the end state in terms of the, the size of the Iraqi army, the size of the other elements of the military, Iraqi military, the Iraqi police, and when do you foresee getting there? We've got a, uh, a force that we've agreed upon with the, uh, the current sitting government, and of course when the new government comes in, we, we'll have uh, some opportunities there to discuss that, that with them as well. Right now we're building a 10 division army. Uh, it's, a, it's a light infantry army with some enablers that will allow it to have some ability to project force around the country. And at end state, it'll number approximately 160,000. The police, for, the, to talk about the MOI forces, you, we really have to break it down into the, into the separate components. There, there are special police, and there's approximately 25,000 of those. They're almost at end state now. And those are commandos and public order uh, battalions. And then there is the, what you and I would describe as the, uh, the station house police. And based on a ratio of approximately 1 to 200 by population, uh, that number comes out to about 135,000. And we're right at about 75,000 trained and equipped right now. Uh, we train about uh, 3,500 every couple of months at a variety of institutions, both inside Iraq and out. Um, then there's also border police. We need 27,000 border police. We're at 18,000. There's a 6,000-man highway patrol. We have 3,000. I think the simplest way to, to uh, answer your question about end state is that that force, uh, as I just described it, is the agreed upon force. We call it the objective coin force, counterinsurgency force, because it has the, the necessary capabilities broadly to provide internal security. And uh, the Army will largely be built out uh, in 06, and, and the police will be largely built out in the first half of 07. Paul, just a quick follow up. Sure. Uh, General uh, Bob Burns again. Uh, on the Air Force, are you planning to um, train and, and uh, develop an, uh, an Air Force that would include uh, Iraqi attack air, air, uh, air crews? Well, 
Well, the, the air, I, I'm glad you brought that up because it allows me to mention that what we've got is we've got essentially three phases here in terms of uh, Iraq's national security. We've got this objective counterinsurgency force, which is largely, as you might expect, a ground-centric uh, force. And yet we also have a five-year plan inside of a 10-year vision. And we're working with our Iraqi counterparts to determine what so what force they will uh, over time require to account for their external security as well. And, and in doing so, we realize that they will, as we discuss this with them, they're going to have to make some decisions, as any nation does, about what size ground force can they afford in order to uh, modernize what they have and also to put uh, money into other than ground forces. So stated another way, they have 10 divisions uh, out through 06, 07, but they may not, not end up with 10 divisions in the future as they decide how to uh, account for the budget share uh, 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 from their economy and, and uh, apply it to modernization and to the addition of things like aircraft. Let's go to Jim and then over to Tom. <clears throat> General you, uh, Jim McLeshevsky, NBC, you've recently been handed the mission of developing uh, the Ministry of Interior, uh, which oversees the police forces. So uh, I'd like to ask you about the quality of the police forces. Uh, there's increasing evidence that many of these local police forces uh, have been infiltrated, if not taken over by militias. Uh, we still get uh, occasional reports of uh, uh, many of these uh, local police forces not being paid. Uh, at any given time, uh, and uh, instances of uh, corruption. Uh, just how serious a problem is that? And, and how do you get a handle on that uh, to, to rid these police forces of these militias uh, and, and corruption, and in some cases, inefficiencies? <laughs> that may have been one question, Jim, but it's, it's a PhD. It's going to require a PhD level answer, but let me give it a shot. Um, yeah, we took over the, uh, we've, we've had police for some time, and uh, to get at the quality issue, I can tell you that a significant portion of their training uh, in the classroom and also in vignettes and practical exercises is on uh, policing, protecting and serving in a democratic system, human rights, rule of law. Uh, and then we partner with them. I've got uh, international police liaison officers spread throughout the country who partner with uh, police forces, and they do a couple of things. Most important, probably, in answer to your question, is they role model and they coach, teach, and mentor on, on uh, proper conduct in a democratic society. The special police forces, we actually have transition teams, just as the Army units do. We call those special police transition teams. And again, their, their role is to oversee, uh, mentor, coach, cajole, and do whatever they've got to to, to bring this thing along in a way that uh, makes it a contributor to the national cohesion and not to uh, national divisiveness. Now, the, the question about militias is really a, a separate uh, but certainly related question. Uh, police forces, contrary to army forces, are locally recruited and tend to, be, uh, lo and tend to live and, and uh, work locally. So what you find is that police forces naturally uh, tend to be uh, se uh, tend to be of single ethnic groups and are conflicted. And uh, I think that w what you hear in places in the Southeast in particular, but not just in the Southeast, is some of those conflicting loyalties at work. Um, as you know that the, uh, the oh, or maybe you don't know, but in 06 we've determined that we will make police forces uh, in general a uh, our point of emphasis we're calling 2006 the year of the police in internal to Minsticky. And uh, we tr we're going to try to get additional partnership teams out there to work with these uh, police in order to kind of uh, address some of the concerns you're hearing about. Corruption is another matter. Uh, there is a, um, um, th they are taking a, a honest uh, shot at corruption and our uh, uh, intervention into these ministries in significant numbers uh, I think is helping in that regard, but uh, you know there there is uh, I guess I would describe it as uh, uh, some bad habits that have to be overcome here, and uh, it's why when I talk to people about progress, I I always make I'm very careful to note the fact that progress at the local tactical level is is ahead of significantly progress at the national institutional level uh, for all the reasons you mentioned and. Uh, 
we're working it. And a quick follow-up. But, General, how critical are the police to uh, countering the insurgency in Iraq? And just how serious is this problem with these militias? The, uh, the, the special police in particular provide a vital function uh, in, in uh, countering the insurgents uh, and terrorist and foreign fighter threat because they are a bridge for us. You heard me mention what, if we have a problem in a particular city, we generally use the military or the, Iraqs, the Iraqis generally use the military to uh, restore stability. And then the, these commandos come in because they've got some policing skills, some civil security skills, but they've also got some top end combat skills and that's our bridge. While we uh, retrain if necessary or uh, recruit and then train some of the police that may have been overwhelmed by these insurgents. So the, the special police in particular have a definite role in the counterinsurgency. You know, the local police, um, it, it's really our goal, our long range goal here is to restore civil security. And so we've, we've armed the police different than we might have armed police uh, in, an, in another environment. I mean, they, they uh, typically have access to AK-47s, for example, and body armor and helmets and things that, um, that you wouldn't expect a normal police force elsewhere to, to uh, look like. But we've got we've to walk away from that. I mean, we've got to get to the point where the police are truly uh, uh, an element of local civil control as opposed to counterinsurgent forces. And all that is being worked as part of this uh, 2006 year of the police that I mentioned. Now, as for militias, the Article 117 of their constitution, the, Iraq, the constitution that the Iraqis just passed, um, uh, first of all, it forbids any other armed force outside of the legitimate security forces of, of, uh, at the national level, which is to say it, it outlaws militias. It also accounts for the possibility of regions having home guards or regional guards. Frankly, the Iraqi government has to figure out what they mean by that. And I think you'll find this new government to take that on. When you ask how serious is it, uh, the seriousness of it is uh, more or less in that it undermines the, the Iraqi security forces that we're training and equipping as the sole provider, the legitimate source of authority and force in Iraq. And so it's, it is a serious problem, and, uh, and one which uh, you know, we all work on. And now, as you know, we don't tolerate the presence of militias when we encounter it. And secondly, we do, on the other hand, encourage individuals who might have been part of a militia to come into the uh, service um, as individuals, not as units. And that has actually worked out OK. I mean, I, even in my first tour here, I, I had the occasion to, uh, to do some of that. And if they come in and if they uh, pledge this oath and if they then demonstrate that they will live up to it, uh, typically it, it turns out okay. But yeah, we've got, to go, we've got some work to do in that regard. Tom. General Tom Bowman with the Baltimore Sun. General Abizade said in the spring that the Iraqi forces could take the lead by the end of 2005. And then uh, he later amended it to say that maybe the spring or summer of 2006 they could take the lead. And now this week with the National Strategy for Victory in Iraq that was released, it talks here about in the short term, uh, you'll be standing up security forces, and then in the medium term, they'll be, quote, in the lead defeating terrorists. How do you define the medium term? How many years off would that be? Well, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not really uh, exactly familiar with uh, how we translate calendar years into short and midterm. I can tell you what... My part of it is, is, and that is to build the force that then goes into the field and begins to perform, but there's a performance aspect as well. It's not just sticking it out there. It's got to actually be able to perform, and so there's a much more holistic answer to that question. However, um, uh, the, uh, I think I'd also like to mention that Iraqi security forces are in the lead right now. Um, you know the numbers because I, I think you've probably uh, seen the previous briefings, but uh, you know, 40 of them are in the lead right now, and 33 own their own battle space, and uh, 100 of them are out there in the fight. And I'm talking about just the Army and, the, of course, the police as well. And so uh, in, the term in the lead is uh, if it implies that they're, they're not going to be doing anything in the interim between now and the midterm is just not a fair characterization of what's going on over here. Sure, this is the national <laughs> strategy for victory in Iraq that the president released this week. Have you seen it? It says medium term. Iraqi forces are in the lead. I'm just asking you to define that. Yeah, sure. I did see it. I got it. I got it yesterday when it was released, and uh, I have not yet 
uh, made sure that, that uh, I completely understand the time horizons, but I, I, I'm sure that, uh, um, that the definitions in there are consistent with the definitions we've been using over here. What you're asking me for is dates, and I'm not prepared to give you those. Let's move on to Pam. Sir, this is Pam Hess with UPI. Um, with regard to the uh, Iraqi, uh, the Interior Ministry jail that General Horst came upon, are you guys doing anything um, in general to take a survey of where other such facilities might be and check out conditions there? And uh, could you elaborate for us on, on what's been happening with that since then? Yes, I can. Uh, and when you say you guys, I mean, this is not my particular um, part of the uh, operation, but I have been in meetings and so I can share with with you what we're doing. I mean, I clearly we're taking that very seriously. There's kind of two separate tracks. There's the, the Iraqi-led uh, investigation into the bunker in particular, and that, that, uh, that investigation is ongoing. And then there is the uh, issue of uh, trying to determine if there are other facilities like this out, out there. And that, um, that uh, analysis of intelligence reports, really, it's, it's looking back through all intelligence reports to see where there have been reports that may have indicated the existence of similar facilities. And then that list is being um, um, put together. And then there'll be an inspection team, including, this one is, is led by us, but with Iraqis. And they will go out and uh, inspect those facilities uh, to, to see, uh, on an unannounced basis, I should mention, to see if, uh, in fact, there's any um, substance to the, uh, to the report. So yeah, both, both tracks are working when that process might begin, the inspection process, or how long the intel part will take? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that, Pam, honestly, because I don't know how long the list is. Um, I think it'll, that's really what it'll, it'll be determined. And it's going to focus initially in and around Baghdad, of course, but I also think it'll take a look uh, more broadly than that. Sorry, what is the unit that's, or what's the entity that's in charge of this? You said it's not your bailiwick, really. What's the U.S. entity that is? Uh, the multinational force level, uh, you know, General Casey's staff is is uh, working, I think, with the uh, uh, C with the C2 uh, to de to develop the list in particular. General, it's Gordon Lubol at Army Times. I, as I understand it, uh, one of the challenges to getting uh, Iraqi security forces to operate independently is is the logistics piece. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit to what your uh, you're doing there to train uh, those folks and where the shortage is like? Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> that's a good question. There's really the, the three things that have been, uh, I, I suppose, uh, most uh, notable in, in, in letting these units advance toward independence or self-reliance have been logistics communications and the production of junior officers. I'll, I'll, if you'd like, I can talk to all three of those, but I'll answer your question about uh, logistics in particular. This, this army we're building is largely a fixed army, and so um, it has a, a, a structure that goes from the, a national depot, which exists in Taji, just north of Baghdad, and then there are five regional support units that each have two divisions that draw supplies off of them. Um, all five of those regional support units are built and in various stages of uh, preparation to become uh, self-reliant. And then the link from there down to the tactical unit is provided by a motor transport regiment, several hundred trucks that push supplies down to headquarters and support companies at the battalion level. And all by April, all of the, of the HSCs, the headquarters and support companies, will be built out. And so uh, you'll have the, uh, the thing remaining to be built are these motor transport regiments, which uh, you know, we need 10 of them, and there are several hundred trucks in each. We'll have most of the equipment on hand in the next six months. And then it's a matter of training the logisticians. We just trained, we have the Iraqi Army uh, Service Support Institute up in Taji, north of Baghdad again. We just graduated our 1,000th uh, Iraqi soldier out of that institute. And so we've got a build plan uh, that goes out through 06 to put this logistic structure in place. And we're focusing the uh, effort on those units, those Iraqi divisions that are closest to uh, being prepared to transition. So it's all nested together, the production and the, and the, uh, the transition campaign plan. 
And General, it's Mike Mount with uh, CNN. I'm sure you've heard some of the, uh, the reports in the last few days about uh, the uh, U.S. military working with an organization to place articles, um, uh, paying to have articles placed into Iraqi newspapers. Uh, has there been anybody with your organization or anybody uh, working with your organization to place uh, articles in papers around Iraq um, promoting what you all are doing at Minsticky? Yeah, no, we don't, we don't uh, have, I don't even have an information operations staff officer. We don't do information operations, and the Iraqis are not nearly ready to do information operations uh, systemically. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's uh, safe to say that this is all being reviewed, and I suspect that you'll, you'll, uh, there'll be a statement uh, put out. Uh, nobody's more introspective and, and self-analyzing uh, than, than us, and I'm sure there'll be a statement made here sometime soon. Can I follow that up? You know, we've uh, reached the end of our time, and so we'll allow the general to have any uh, closing comments that he might want to make, and uh, uh, we'll leave it at that. General, back to you. Well, I appreciate that. I hadn't prepared any uh, particular comments. I would like to say that, uh, you know, behind all of this, we, we talk about the systemic level and this and that is, but we've got some pretty brave young men and women out there that are living and working and uh, coaching these Iraqis along. and I'd, I'd like to always ask you to remember that, that at the business end of this thing is a bunch of hardworking young men and women of America who are trying their best to get this thing right. And then the other thing I'll, I'll say is uh, it's, it's the holiday season. I'll, I'll wish you all happy holidays and Merry Christmas. And also uh, tell you that as far as we're concerned over here, uh, we think uh, we're probably doing a pretty good job of bringing peace on earth and goodwill to men in particularly this mission we're doing to hand over security to the Iraqi forces. And then lastly, if there's anybody from the United States Navy in the room, I'd like to say beat Navy. Take care of yourself. <laughs> well, General, thanks for spending some time with us this morning, and uh, we hope to have you back in a, in a few more weeks to give us another update. Thank you.